Okay, so one of the hardest things to be is a Christian in an age that feels like all the Christians are crazy and act very little like Jesus. And it seems like there's no proof for anything that we believe in. I mean, really, as high schoolers, you go to school and you learn facts from biology class. And then that night, you go to HSM and you learn beliefs from youth group. And anybody will tell you that facts are real and beliefs are not. Science is what actually happens and faith is what we would like to be real. So how do we follow Jesus in an age where it already feels super difficult to follow Jesus, much less having to deal with what we would like to believe versus what we have proof in that is real? So you either have to stick your head in the sand and pretend that science and math and education are not real, or you have to pretend that it's all some big conspiracy aimed at getting people not to believe. And that's where we fall into the whole divided political mess where we find ourselves arguing about everything. So honestly, religion seems like it's just something we keep to ourselves and we skip the whole emotional circus of arguments that go back and forth. In order for you to believe, we've got to skip critical thinking and we just have to believe a bunch of stuff that can't be proved and then keep it to ourselves. And a lot of people, you know, they anchor their beliefs in the Bible. You know, they would say, well, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. And so a lot of times when we think about the Bible and Christians and faith and belief and all that sort of thing, we think of it wrapped up in a book somewhere. And, you know, there are lots of books. There are lots of religions. There are lots of ways to believe. And how do we know the Bible is unique? Like, isn't it just like any other religion out there? Listen, I want to tell you something today. The Bible is actual history. Listen, we know a man named Abram existed thousands of years ago. And that's where the Old Testament kind of starts. It's the first historic reference to a person is Abram. I mean, there are inscriptions on stones that locate where he was that we can see outside the Bible. See, a long time ago, it was popular to think the Bible was just a bunch of stories that were just made up. Professors would laugh about the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites, and they would say, there's no proof for any of these people or groups existing until archaeology came along and said, oh, we actually found the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Bible is actually accurate. <laughs> See, the Bible is history. Even the crazy stories, you know, they're crazy stories like Jericho, where the Israelites walked around Jericho and the walls fell down. Funny thing, Catherine Kenyon, a very famous archaeologist back in the 50s, actually discovered the ancient city of Jericho and found that the walls did fall down and they fell inward like the Bible describes in the spring of the year. But when the biblical story of Joseph details how Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 shekels of silver, it's amazing to realize that when they did archaeological digs in other areas around there in the ancient Near East, they found that's exactly how much slaves were sold for. There's no way someone hundreds of years later could have guessed that accuracy. You and I, listen, you and I, I could, if I had a lot of money, I would say this whole group, let's get on a plane and let's travel to Turkey. We can go to Turkey right now and go to a museum and we can see these names, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego carved into stone. You know who they were? They were the friends of Daniel described in the Bible. You know, the whole fiery furnace thing, Daniel in the lion's den. We think of these as like little kid stories. They aren't just stories. These things actually happened in history. So look, compare that with other religions and you will see a huge difference. Now listen, pause here because I'm not bashing on other religions. Okay. Other religions, uh, I, I believe they can learn a lot from them personally. I like studying parts of Islam and Buddhism. I think there's some really amazing ethical systems you can take from them, but there's a big difference between what we find in these other religions and particularly what the Bible describes for us. See, other religions place a high value on ethics and morals and religious practice, but the Bible is unique in how it details a story of God who reaches out to a man named Abram thousands of years ago and says he will bring the Messiah, Jesus, from this one family thousands of years later and the whole earth will be saved through his death and resurrection. No other religion makes the same claim. And I know, it sounds crazy. How do we know it wasn't just added to over the years? You know, like whisper down the lane, little story got bigger and bigger, like a giant snowball just got bigger and bigger. It's like a fish story, you know, like, well, it was this big. No, it's this big, you know, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter three. We're gonna look at 2 Timothy chapter three. We're gonna look in verse 14. So grab your phones, or if you got a Bible there. So an early follower of Jesus, his name is Paul. He's writing to a young student of his named Timothy. And this is what he says. But you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now look, Paul says a few things here. He says, you can trust those who taught you. He mentions the people who were instructing Timothy and mentions that they are trustworthy. But then he goes on to talk about the scriptures. So what's he talking about here? He's not talking about the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. He says, all scripture is inspired by God. That means that God not only gave us the message of the Old Testament, but that he preserved it for us so that we know we can trust it. And God uses the Bible to prepare us to do good things because the law of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And the testimony of the disciples gives us Jesus' teaching. See, Paul's basically saying that the Bible is unique. It is a message given to us by God and preserved by God. When you read the Bible, you are reading a message from God. Now think about this, I mean, this is trippy. The Old Testament gives us God's law, you know, like the Ten Commandments and all the different laws and stuff like that. Some of the stuff that you think, boy, it's kind of boring or whatever. This is what the Jews would call the word of the Lord. A lot of times what they'll just say is the word when they talk about the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the word of the Lord became flesh. Jesus was the living embodiment of all of God's law. And there is nothing like this anywhere in the world. All the other religions show people how they can chase after God. The Bible is the only work that shows us how God is chasing us in the person of Jesus. God's word came to us in the person of Jesus. That's what Emmanuel means. It means God with us. Every other religion out there is all about how we can somehow pray the right way, have the right posture, do the right things. I mean, in Hinduism, you've got like bhakti and moksha. You talk about duty and discipline. In Zazen, you know, if you have the right position and posture, you can somehow attain enlightenment, release from uh, and, and into nirvana. I mean, you've got all these things, how you can chase after God. But when we talk about Jesus and when we talk about the Bible, it is all about how God comes to us. And so look, I know you're saying, yeah, John, you know, that's why we're doing this series. Don't all religions claim to be the only truth. How can you know that the Bible is true? And how can you read the Bible to support the Bible? I mean, so we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and on, that said, well, the Bible is God's word. But isn't that reading the Bible to support the Bible? Isn't that like saying, Walt Disney World concluded it is the best theme park ever? <laughs> can you really trust that? Or, you know, Baker Mayfield said the Browns are the best team in football. Of course he's going to say that. It's a circular argument. How can you trust it? All right, so I got a cool story for you. So we used to have some doubts about whether the Bible changed a lot over time, okay? It used to be back in the 1940s. The oldest manuscript of the Bible we have was 1100 AD. Okay, so here's my little timeline, 1100 AD, okay? And the time it was written was somewhere around 1500 BC. So that's a long time, right? You're talking like 2,600 years. So a lot could have changed in that time. So here's the story. Back in 1948, there were some shepherd boys. They were following some sheep. They were trying to make sure the sheep were all staying in the fold. Sometimes sheep scamper up into little caves. So they took their rocks and they're throwing them in the caves to scare the sheep out of the caves. When they threw a rock into one of the caves, they heard this sound of like breaking glass, like Ksh! So they threw a few more rocks and then they jumped up into the caves and they saw this amazing thing. They saw all this pottery, all these like canisters. And so they looked inside and there were scrolls all in there. So they got their dad, their dad got some other people, these Egyptologists, these people that study all this kind of stuff came and they're like, oh my gosh, this is a library. And it dated from 300 BC. So again, let's go back to our timeline, 1100 AD. Now you got something from 300 BC. It turned out to be a library of the Old Testament. It was a complete work of the Old Testament from 300 BC. So, okay, let's do the math here. 1100 AD was our earliest copy of the Old Testament we have. Now we got something all the way back 1400 years earlier. And so there were some pointy headed professors who were like, we're gonna show the world how the Bible's just like any other book out there. They were licking their chops. They're thinking like, we're finally gonna show that the Bible is not unique. So that was in 1948. 1950 came and went, we didn't hear anything. 1960, didn't hear anything. 1970, didn't hear anything. Oh my gosh, it's like 30 years. 1980 comes and goes and they're finally like, look, under threat of lawsuit, you've got to tell us what you found. And they finally released their findings. Do you know what they found out? Essentially nothing 
had changed from 300 BC to 1100 AD, and we've never seen anything like that. The guy who led the project, his name is Giza Vermish. I have his book, if you wanna read it sometime. He wrote in the preface to the Dead Sea Scrolls, he said, hey, we've never seen anything like this, it's nothing short of a miracle. See, I believe that God preserved the Bible for us, for a reason. And look, I wanna make sure that we get something straight here. The Bible is not God's gift to us, okay? Jesus is God's gift to us. The thing that we hang our hat on, the anchor of our faith is the resurrection, not the Bible. The Bible can easily become an idol, but there's something eerie about how God has preserved the Bible for us. I mean, think about that for a minute. He's put a lot of effort into making sure that you and I read it. And it is not like any other book out there. There is something very unique about our Bible. And the question is, what does he want me to hear about that he spent so much effort in making sure that it was preserved for someone like me? So the next time you hear somebody say, well, you know, the Bible's just like any other book out there and Christianity's just like any other religion, just get all ninja on and be like, no, it wasn't, I heard this guy. I mean, don't, don't get all upset. You know, because sometimes people get all, all defensive. They're like, you know, I, I defend the Bible. No, I defend Christianity. I defend Jesus. And listen, don't, don't defend the Bible if you're not gonna read it. <laughs> Instead of getting upset, you gotta ask yourself the question. If God spent all this effort to preserve it for you, and he wants for you to hear the message, why are you not reading it? 